So very cool. So I, I am honored that she's able to check that box off her list today. But Rachel is, uh, Rachel is the director of wellness at uh, SIG in Baltimore. Uh, she also has her own blog, which she's a, an award-winning bloggist. Uh, she's a foodie and just an all-around great person. So it really is my pleasure and privilege to, to introduce Miss Rachel. So Rachel. <laughs> powerful. Food plays a significant role in each of our lives because all of us have to eat to live. I've seen how food can bring people together, connect them, nourish them, energize them, and even heal them. But I've also seen how confusing it can be and how it can divide us. Eating well can feel overwhelming and more like something we feel like we have to do instead of something we want to do. But what if it didn't have to be that way? What if we could reframe why, how, and what we eat? Today, I invite you to take a real food reset and discover what it means to eat on purpose. So as we begin our time together today, let's see what the great philosopher Jim Gaffigan has to teach us about food. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> so aren't we just so confused? My goodness, we are so confused about what to eat, aren't we? There's a new health trend or a new diet or a new fad that comes out every other week that that tells us it's going to be the solution, the answer, the thing that we've always been wanting to know and the thing that's going to solve all of our problems. But as a result of all of this, as a result of all of the confusion, so many of us are left feeling frustrated and overwhelmed. We have no idea what to eat. We have no idea who to listen to, where to go for credible information about food. And we see signs like this on social media and in the news. As a result of words like this, language like this that we're using, so many people are walking around feeling anxious about every meal and afraid of food. To add to the confusion, this was alluded to yesterday in Mitch's talk, <laughs> to add to the confusion around food, there's also so much guilt and so much judgment that people are feeling when it comes to eating. Perhaps you can relate to this. <laughs> I'm not going to ask for a show of hands for people to tell me which of you is the food police. That's certainly not the goal, to incriminate anyone here. But it's interesting what happens, isn't it, when you tell someone that you're the wellness person. I tell someone, yes, if we're sitting down at a meal together and they ask what I do, oh yes, I'm a wellness consultant, I'm a health coach, a blogger, and immediately it's like they've come to confession. <laughs> I usually don't drink soda, like I'm actually, I, I just am kind of dragging today, so I'm, I'm just having this one soda. Um, or, or I don't usually go to McDonald's, but like this is like a once a week kind of thing, so just, you know, don't judge me. Or, better yet, Mitch asked if I was going to bring up cupcakes, and I said, I said yes, actually, because what used to happen at my company a couple years ago, before I really got this, if cupcakes or donuts were brought into the office, people would just wait for my eye rolling to start. <laughs> They wait for it. They're just waiting for us to judge them. And you know what I realized? I realized it took me a few years to realize this. But they didn't trust me. They felt judged by me. And I remember feeling so frustrated. I remember thinking to myself in my mid-20s with all of my worldly wisdom, why don't they just listen to me? I'm the wellness person. I know. I know. They should listen to me. And I would, I would become so frustrated that people just, they, they didn't want to hear what I had to say about this. And I realized it was because I didn't create a safe space for them. And if we want to be effective at what we're doing, if we really want to be effective, and we want to connect with people, we want them to seek us out, and we want them to listen to us, we have got to be approachable, relatable, 
and not judgmental. We have to stop doing that to people. They're not going to want to come to us. So whether you're employee facing or you're at the table with decision makers, this is equally true and equally important to find these points where you can relate, to find these commonalities with people. And this is especially true when it comes to something as personal as food. So what we want to do right now, we have a tremendous opportunity to reframe the conversation around food, to shift our language and to move away from diets and deprivation and calorie counting and fat grams. We can't just relegate food to these little things. Food is so much more than that. So we have an opportunity to shift the conversation to be something that's positive and inviting and uplifting and refreshing and supportive and encouraging to show people how amazing food can be, and they don't have to be afraid of it anymore. So how do we do this? By encouraging people to get curious. I love the word curiosity. It's about being open. It's about exploring. And it's most importantly about noticing without judging. When we invite people on a journey to explore food, it assumes that they are capable of making good decisions, because they are. Most of us don't want to be told what to do. The employees that you work with and the leaders you work with really don't want to be told either. We want to have an opportunity to explore and to figure that out for ourselves. And so I'm going to share a story with you guys about what happened when I got curious. When I got curious about food, my body, and my health. And this is what drives my purpose. This is why I do the work that I do. You may be dealing with things that are challenging for you, but I can promise you that if you can, if you can have the perspective that perhaps one day, whatever challenge you're dealing with is ultimately going to be the reason why you do what you do and the reason you're able to reach people in the way that you are that nobody else can, that is what I have learned through my journey. Food has always had a special place in my life. When I was a little girl, I loved going grocery shopping into farmers markets with my mom. I remember at Christmas time, we would bake cookies and muffins and put them in little baggies and hand them out to all of our neighbors. I remember spending time with my elderly neighbor, Miss Muriel, who loved Julia Child, and she would have me over for cooking lessons. And she taught me how to make bread and pasta and cheesecake and paper thin sugar cookies. I spent my summers in high school working at a produce stand, teaching people the art of picking out the perfect watermelon or the juiciest peach. And I spent a semester in college living in southern Spain. And it was at that time that, as a very picky eater at the time, I learned to explore this whole new world of food that I had never known before. So food has always played a special role in my life. I write a blog called Rachel's Nourishing Kitchen. I started this blog about two years ago. And in the first month of writing the blog, I published a post with this title, How I Lost 20 Pounds, Got Back to My High School Weight, and Kept It Off. And I was shocked to see the response to this post, the number of people that were reading it. I realized I had hit on something here. People wanted to know how to lose weight, they wanted to know how to keep it off, and they really wanted to know how they could get back to how they looked in high school. It started with a weight loss program that I brought to my company in 2010. I was meticulously tracking everything that I was eating for several months. And I realized I was actually eating more real, whole, unprocessed foods. And I was moving my body consistently. So these were good things. And I started to lose weight, and I was elated. And it was because for the first time, for the first time in my life, I felt like I looked the part of what I thought the wellness person should look like. And so it gave me this sense of credibility. And I was very proud of where I was. I continued to make tweaks to my diet. And about three years ago, I got down to my lowest weight. My body felt and functioned like that of a 14-year-old girl. And at a time when many women my age were starting families and talking about having children, that time of the month stopped coming for me for seven months in a row. And I was scared. I was scared, and I was confused, and I was frustrated, and I did not understand what my body was doing. But despite all of this, the compliments kept coming. 
Rachel, you look great. How much weight have you lost? I don't remember you being this small. And I soaked it in. Oh my gosh, my ego loved every second of it because it felt so good to hear these words from people. But I knew, I knew, I felt like a fraud because deep down I knew something was wrong that they didn't know. And so I sought the help of an integrative medicine doctor and I went to her and I had some testing done. And I remember when I got my lab results back and how shocked I felt as she told me that I was clinically malnourished. And I thought, well, that's not what the wellness person's supposed to be. The wellness person's not supposed to be malnourished. How can anyone find this out? What will they think of me? And I remember her telling me something that terrified me. She said, you might need to gain some weight. I didn't know what to do with that. You might need to change your diet. And if you really want help on this, you should probably see a nutritionist. And so because I knew that my body wasn't well, and because I cared enough about my future, I decided to do something about it. And so I sought the help of a nutritionist, and I started working with her. And this nutritionist was trained in something called functional medicine. If you have a condition, a health condition, you know someone that has a condition that has not been resolved, they've seen a number of doctors, functionalmedicine.org. It is a phenomenal website, and it's how I found my practitioners who ultimately helped me. And she helped me get to the root cause of why I wasn't well. And I started, to, I started to feel better. I started to make some changes. And what she made me realize is this. Everything connects to everything else. I never connected it before. The years of antibiotics I took throughout my childhood, a decade of taking medicine for acid reflux, years of eating processed foods, Years of dealing with bronchitis and sinus issues and ear infections and allergies and concerns about my fertility, I had never connected them before. I never connected what I was eating with how I was feeling or how my body was functioning. And I never thought nutrition could be at the root of why I wasn't well. But I was determined to feel better and I was determined to heal my body and so I had to reframe eating. I had to reframe why I was eating. I had to shift it from a means of losing weight to a means of restoring my health and giving me hope for my future. And so I started to make changes. I started to gain weight. I started to remove the foods that were making me feel unwell and add in ones that were healing me. And my body started to respond. The body wants so badly to be well, and mine wanted to be well. And when I gave it what it needed, it responded. And now I feel the best I've ever felt. I have energy all day long. I'm on zero medications. My allergies are gone. My skin is glowing. My body functions like a healthy body should. And I now have hope that if I want to be a mom one day, that that is possible. And that means so much to me. And so that's why I do this. And I realize, you know what? My body is still changing. My body is going to continue to change. And so is yours. And the science around the body and food and health is going to continue to change. So all we have to do is invite people in and invite them to be curious about themselves and their bodies and food and how it all connects. So what I've realized in the midst of this, and that I hope you can see, is that this is not just about food. This is about life. And through food, I got my life back. I got my life back. And that is why I do this work. My hope is that you'll walk away today feeling inspired and empowered to eat differently. Not because I said so, but because you're going to want to. You're really going to want to by the time we're done today. So this is the framework we're going to be using. Connect, savor, and nourish. Food is about connection. Connecting with why we eat, how it makes us feel, where our food comes from, the impact it has beyond our plate. Savoring is about empowering people to slow down enough to taste their food so that food becomes an experience instead of an afterthought. And then nourishment is about fueling our body with the most energizing, life-giving food so that we can feel and be our best. So let's start with connecting. We're going to connect at two levels, one with the individual and one as the collective connection. So I ask you guys a question. Let's say it's New Year's Day and someone comes to you and they say, I want to start eating healthier because I want to do what? What might they fill in that blank with? I want to eat healthier because I want to do what? Lose weight. Lose weight. Yes. 
And so what do we end up doing? We end up going on diets and we deprive ourselves and we use really morally judgmental language like I'm cheating or I'm not cheating or junk food or health food or whatever it is. And we place all of these moral judgments on food and people feel less than. This makes people feel less alive and that's not what we want. Now I'm not saying in and of itself, I want you to hear me on this. In and of itself, wanting to lose weight is not bad or wrong. It's not. But so many of the programs that we do that are tied to eating are also tied directly to weight. And there are so many other benefits from eating well besides weight loss. And this is something that a lot of people really want to hear. People are ready to hear this. People are ready to hear this. They want to move beyond weight. And they want us to focus on what matters. And like Elizabeth just said, it was such, perfect, such perfect timing, people want to feel good. That's why you don't have to incentivize people to come to happy hours, right? <laughs> people want to feel good. And so when it comes to food, what if we can show people how food can help them feel better and give them more of what they want? Then they'll want to do it. They'll be into it. As we go into this section, I just want to mention this. We a lot of times use the word healthy. We are reframing. Here's, here's the interesting thing about this. There are a lot of people that have negative connotations with the word healthy. So I'm going to ask you, to not call it healthy food anymore. Hmm, that's interesting. And the reason why is because there's this concept called expectation assimilation. It's written about in the book Mindless Eating by Dr. Brian Wansink, who I'll bring up again. It's a really fantastic book. And one of the things he writes about is that things end up tasting the way we expect them to taste. So if we decide that something healthy is going to taste bad, then we try it and it tastes bad. So if we're using the word healthy to draw people in, it may be turning some people away. So what can we use instead? What can we do instead? These are some of the titles of the workshops I teach. I teach a lot of workshops to companies, and these are some of the titles. So it's related to energy, boosting our immunity, saving money, boosting our brain, looking beautiful, managing our stress, and ditching diets. People don't want to be on diets. <laughs> they don't. They don't want to be on diets. And you know what? These are the things that matter to people. And guess what? These are the things that matter to businesses, too. Businesses want employees who are energized, who don't get sick, who aren't stressed about money, who manage their stress, who, who think really clearly. This is one of the things that businesses want. So if we want businesses to jump on board, let's stop calling them healthy eating programs. Let's call them eating for energy programs. Let's call them brain booster programs. Let's call them immune boosting programs or immune-boosting foods. These are the types of words that we can use that are appealing to people. This is what people want. This is what matters to them. So we can align with something that Weight Watchers, interestingly, a company, nothing negative about Weight Watchers, it's just a, a point for the purpose of um, what I'm about to say. Even Weight Watchers, a company who has the word weight in the name of their company, they have responded to consumer demand by rolling out a program at the beginning of this year called Beyond the Scale. So if Weight Watchers is going beyond the scale, like I think we can too. People are wanting more. So what I'm going to ask you to do, you have uh, pieces of colored paper on your table that are different colors. Some are green, some are yellow, some are orange. There should be one for everyone. If you do not have one, please raise your hand. There should be enough for everyone. We're going to do an activity right now called a weightless why. So your weightless why is the reason why you eat whole, real, nourishing food that has absolutely nothing to do with the number on the scale. How do you want to feel? What do you want more of in your life? I'm going to give you guys a few examples. I'll leave this up here when we do the activity. But these are just some of the examples. When we eat that way, when we eat whole real nourishing food, these are the types of benefits that we can expect to receive. So I'll put this back up. What I'm going to ask you to do is write your weightless why in the bubble. If you are a tweeter, <laughs> you can tweet it with the summit hashtag and hashtag weightless why, if you would like to do that, but you don't have to. So I'd like you to take a minute and a half and just do that right now, and then we will share a few. All right, I'd 
I'd like to hear from a few people. I'd like to hear from maybe about five people, and if you could say in less than 10 words <laughs> what your weightless why is. Who wants to share their weightless why? This is, again, the reason why you want to eat whole, real, nourishing food that has nothing to do with weight. Who wants to share? Yes, right up front. You can shout it out. My weightless why is to enjoy a vibrant life and be happy. Everything else falls into place. Mm. To enjoy a vibrant life and be healthy. Every, happy. Everything else falls into place. That's wonderful. Who else wants to share? Yep, right back there. Sarah. Yeah. To be healthier, set a good example, and encourage others. Thank you. How about in the middle here? Sure, in the green shirt. You want to shout at us? Yeah. You can shout it. Yeah, we have kind of limited volunteers. Okay, so there's more to me than my physical self. Mm, there's more to me than my physical self. Yes, absolutely. What's that? How about one over here? Yeah. Ooh, my weightless why is for clear channels to move, for energy to move through my body. Yes, wonderful. So this is an activity, thank you all, this is an activity you can bring back to your workplace. And if you're starting an initiative, no matter what it's related to, you know, really, nutrition, if, you've, if, you've, if you're doing a weight loss program, for instance, and you know that's something that you are already doing, perhaps you can use this to, to augment what you're doing and to give people a different perspective. So it's not to say that whatever you're doing is wrong or bad, but this can be used to, to, to augment anything that you might be doing. Okay, so that's connecting with our individual reasons. Really important to do that. But we're also now going to connect with another reason. Because for some of us, it might not have been so easy to come up with the personal reason. We may connect more closely with something that actually helps the greater good. So when we make eating a social movement, when we tie our eating choices and our eating behaviors and our eating motivations to something that helps the greater good instead of for a personal benefit, so for instance, something that helps the environment or is related to, to sustainability or animal rights or fair wages and treatment of workers or child labor, these are, these are social issues. And so we may not be super motivated by our own personal reasons, but the interesting thing that we've learned, and this is out of research from Stanford University, is that when people tap into the energy around social movements, it can actually result in more dramatic behavior change than just information-based cognitive approaches, which is often what we do, isn't it? We give a handout, I want to know how to eat better, here's a handout, right? Or here's a, here's a tip sheet. But when we can align people with social movements, we can really leverage that energy and that power. One of the most influential things along my food journey has been using these documentaries. I've been watching these documentaries. And what these do is they really bring to light a lot of social issues that many of us may not have any awareness of. Now, you have a list on page 48 in your booklet. I know if I mention it, you'll turn there. But <laughs> in the very last page of your booklet, you have a list of tons of documentaries and books and resources that you can take back with you. And what I love about these documentaries, and I want to say this, this is not about forcing change on people. This is not about advocating for a particular diet. And this is not about instilling fear in people. This is simply about continuing to open up the conversation to invite people to be curious. So what we do, you could do something like having a movie showing. So in an afternoon or an evening, you could invite people to watch a movie together. And you could pick one of these documentaries and kind of create an open forum afterwards and give people the opportunity to share. You know, what did you see? What did you learn? What stood out to you? What was interesting? What are you still curious about? What questions do you still have? And to create that non-judgmental environment where they can just share what they learned and what they saw, and then guess what? They get to decide whether or not they're going to do anything with it. Because again, this is about removing judgment. It's about creating opportunities for people to get curious and to explore. We have a DVD library in our office where we stock these DVDs. They're usually about 10 bucks online. They're pretty cheap. And you can also find these on Amazon Prime or Netflix. So you really don't even have to pay for them. <laughs> Another thing you can do, a very similar vein, is books. So you could do a book club where everyone comes together and reads books like these. And again, you have a list of more in the back of your uh, workbook. But you could do something similar where you have a book club and people come together and have discussions about what they're learning, what they're reading, 
And it's simply to create that safe environment to do that. And again, you, you'll have these titles in your book. So if you miss anything, um, come get me afterwards. Another thing that you can do to tap into, again, this eating as a social movement, some of these were mentioned yesterday. So planting a garden, for instance, having a community garden, starting a farmer's market at work. There's a client of ours that's a health system, and one of the things that they did is a buy local challenge. And so they had the chefs in their cafeteria source seasonal ingredients from local farmers, and then they would feature them on a monthly basis. So one month it might be butternut squash. And so people who have never eaten butternut squash before might get to try it roasted, they might get to try it in a soup, they might get to try it in a salad. And then someone who's never eaten a particular food gets to try it in a safe environment, prepared in a delicious way, and now maybe they've opened up their horizons. So these are some neat things you can do. If you want to find farmers markets or farms near you, there's a website called localharvest.org. And all you do is you punch in your zip code and it'll show you where these places are near where you work or live. It'll also tell you where something um, that's called Community Supported Agriculture, CSA. This is where farms gather shares, crop shares of their farms, and you typically pay either a weekly fee or something at the beginning of the season, and you get access to fresh produce all season long. So these are really great ways to, again, tap into this um, eating as a social movement. One of the social movements our organization has aligned with is something called fair trade. To be honest with you, this is not something I cared about at all. I was very interested in food from the nutrition side, and I was not very interested at all in the, in the social movement stuff until I learned more about it. One of our employees is very, very passionate about fair trade. And so what she did is she went through a process of switching the coffee and tea in our office from conventional to fair trade. And she surveyed us, she gave us samples, we really got to try it. So I want you to stand up if you work for a company or you have ever worked for a company where they supply coffee or tea. If you could stand up. Okay. So look around. Yes, the most people. <laughs> I just want to give you an opportunity to stand up. So you can sit back down. Um, <laughs> but the point here is that all of us are familiar with this, but for most of us, Coffee is just an office supply. Runs out, hopefully it doesn't run out, but <laughs> we get more when it does in a hurry. But for us, it became so much more. It became this conscious cup of coffee because we connected. We connected to where the coffee was coming from and the impact it was having on people that we might never, ever meet. So the video I'm about to show you is from a company called Equal Exchange. And this is the company that we use their name's up there. This is the company that we use that provides fair trade coffee and tea. And the video is going to explain what fair trade means. It's taking a look at another product that this company offers, which is one of my favorites that it is on your table. And you guys are so patiently waiting to eat the chocolate that's on your table. So this is your glucose spike before lunch. So you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to do is watch this video. And it's going to take us through some harsh, kind of some, a little bit of troubling reality, but what I love about it is that it ends with a note of hope. And then we're going to eat what we saw. So as we transition into the next phase, we're going to continue that. We're going to bring equal exchange with us into savor. Savoring our food is about slowing down enough to taste it, to notice what our food tastes like, and to make it an experience. And I, I can't think of a better food to do that with than chocolate. <laughs> so we want to continue to invite people to be curious. This is about, savoring is about getting curious about how we eat. You'll notice we're going to spend most of our time today talking about why we eat and how we eat. And the last portion about specifically what? Because to be honest with you, once we are clear on why we're eating, what we're eating, and the how, the what changes. It's very interesting. We have to spend less time focusing on that. So we're going to take a look now about how we can be curious about chocolate. So if you would grab a piece of chocolate on your table. Oh, the volunteers, there's three tables missing chocolate. <laughs> You could raise your hand if your table doesn't, oh, this entire middle row doesn't have any. Yeah. 
Does anybody else want to run chocolate? <laughs> Look at this sharing. Look at this empathy. I love it. <laughs> everybody wants everybody to have chocolate. <laughs> yeah, keep your hands up if you don't have it. We want no one to go without chocolate, especially after seeing that video. It's like torture, right? You see like the Willy Wonka chocolate fountain and I'm like, sorry, no chocolate. Um. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you still don't have it. Okay. Okay, everybody has chocolate. So now what I'm going to ask you guys to do, if I could get you guys to focus, I know it's hard. <laughs> What I'm going to ask you guys to do is we're going to eat this chocolate not mindfully. Nothing against mindful eating, but I prefer a slightly different way of wording that. How about soulful eating? Mm -hmm. You guys felt that. I heard that. <laughs> eating is meant to be soulful. It is meant to be a full body experience, not just in our head. It's in our whole body. You know when you've had something that tastes good, right? You're just like, oh. like you have that moment, right, where you're like, that was good. It's a whole body. Your whole body just lets go. So what we're going to do is I'm going to invite you to unwrap this piece of chocolate. And then what we're going to do, if you haven't eaten already, um, what I'm going <laughs> to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you on the count of three to break it in half, OK? One, two, three. What did you hear? Yeah. Snap. Real chocolate snaps. So if you're ever curious if chocolate is real or not, this is how you know. It'll snap. So what I'd like you to do, I know this is torture, as, as we're going through this process, your body is gearing up for this chocolate. Your digestive system is like, I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> but before you try it, keep this mentality in mind. This is Benjamin. He's a little boy who is the nephew of one of my coworkers. And his grandmother was telling me a story of the first time he had chocolate. And she had just had a Hershey kiss. She was with his mother. And she had just had a Hershey kiss and gave him one as well. And she just kind of rushed through it, like most of us do. And he said something so profound. He had the chocolate on his tongue, and it was just melting. And he said, Mommy, I felt a burst in my mouth. <laughs> so I want you, as you put this piece of chocolate on your tongue, I want you to imagine and anticipate the burst. So we're going to take 30 seconds. It's just going to sit on your tongue. And we're just going to let it melt. We're going to let it slowly melt. And as we do this, if you feel awkward, you can chew it. But just bear with me. Try to let it melt. Let it saturate your taste buds. Notice how it feels. Notice how the flavor changes. An interesting thing happens. As you have something sweet in your mouth, there's enzymes in your mouth, one called salivary amylase, that actually starts to activate the sugars and turns them on. So your food actually gets tastier the longer that you chew it, the longer that you savor it. So if we're going to eat something that tastes delicious, don't we want to taste it? Don't you want to taste it if it tastes good? So you can chew it. You can do whatever you want. You can let it linger. You can have a contest at your table and see who can let their, their, their chocolate <laughs> go the longest and the slowest. And you can eat the other half whenever you want. So part of savoring, part of savoring, as we just saw, is about slowing down. It's about slowing down. And there's a book, phenomenal book, by the way. Highly recommend this book. It's called The Slow Down Diet. It's by Mark David. He's a nutritionist, and he is the founder of the Institute for the Psychology of Eating. And in this book, he writes about a patient of his called, named Dr. Chen. And Dr. Chen is a doctor of Chinese medicine. And he came to Mark, and he said, I'm having all sorts of digestive issues, and I just don't feel good. So Mark asked him what he was doing. And he said, well, I'm a very busy man. So on the way to work in the morning, I pick up two Egg McMuffins, and then I grab two more Big Macs for lunch, and then on my way home for dinner, I pick up a pizza. So I would imagine that without having any background in nutrition, everybody in this room could probably give him some advice. <laughs> but Mark didn't do that. He didn't start with what. He started with how. And he said, all I want you to do is the next time when you go to McDonald's for lunch, I want you to sit in the parking lot for 20 minutes, and I want you to savor that Big Mac. That's all I want you to do. So Dr. Chen's like, OK, I can do that. <laughs> and an interesting thing happened. Two weeks later, Dr. Chen calls Mark back. And he is in this really excited state. He has wonderful news to share. He says his digestive issues are gone. <laughs> interesting, Lana. And then he says this. He says, you won't believe it, really. 
but I hate Big Macs. <laughs> I've been eating them for 15 years and I can't stand them. Have you ever tried to savor a Big Mac, he said. He said, you can't. You have to eat it fast and smother it with so much ketchup to hide the taste. So how many times do we just rush through our meals that we don't even taste and we eat foods we don't even like? This is about inviting people into this to be curious and to be okay not liking things. That's okay. Another part of savoring is about setting the environment. This is ideally where we would eat our meals. Yes, we can agree with that. The family table. What are other places we eat meals that it's not at a table? Car? Desk? Couch? Car? Bed? What's that? Break room. How about any of these relate? Desk? <laughs> How about the girl? She's just like, sometimes we're like, I'm not even doing plates today. <laughs> I'm going right for the fridge. Um, <laughs> But as a result of this, we've missed out on making eating an experience. And eating is meant to be an experience. And this is part of savoring. We savor our food more when we make an experience out of food instead of treating it like an afterthought. And in the book, Mindless Eating, by Dr. Watson, he writes about uh, a, a coverage of a program that was done on the show 2020, and it's about an experiment done in Hardee's, and they put a group of people in one room, which was like the loud, noisy, typical fast food restaurant space, and they converted another room into something quieter that had soft music playing. They brought in plants, they brought in paintings, they had white tablecloths and tableside service, they had uh, slow jazz playing, very nice. And what they were interested in, in understanding is if this impact, the environment impact of people's eating behaviors. And they found something interesting. They, they found that the people who were in the environment, that ex when eating was an experience, they actually stayed 11 minutes longer over a lunch break. And for some people, maybe have an 11 minute lunch break. Anybody in the room have an 11 minute? <laughs> My husband's a phys ed teacher. He definitely has 11 minute lunch breaks. Um, but very interesting. So that's what they found out. They found that the people rated the food as tasting better. They said they'd be more likely to come back. And even though they ordered dessert, they compensated by eating less of their fries, burgers, and their drinks. So it's so important we make eating an experience. So I'm going to share with you guys a couple ways that we've done that at our company. And then I'm going to ask you guys to come up with some of your own ideas. This is kind of a, a little spin on the traditional uh, potluck, salad potluck. It's called a let us do lunch potluck, where everybody brings in ingredients. And then you sign up to bring an ingredient, and then everybody comes together and makes salads. We've done this with soups, with crock pots. The office smells amazing. <laughs> We've done this with chilies as well. So this, this name is from Lisa Drizga, actually, is an Excellus in New York. And she, she gave me this, this name that they use at, at their company called Let Us Do Lunch Potluck. You can do a Taste the Rainbow Potluck. So this is another fun way to introduce nourishing food without saying we're having a healthy potluck. Because the second you add the word healthy to potluck, fewer people come. <laughs> this is what I found, at least. And so taste the rainbow. Everybody signs up to bring an ingredient that represents a particular color of the rainbow. And then you wear a shirt that is the same color as your food. So then everyone's kind of like colorful and bright and fun. And you, again, you get to say, we're having, a, we're having this potluck without saying it's healthy. And inevitably, it's going to end up you know, having some nourishing foods. This is one of people's like favorite things that we do. It's a make your own trail mix bar. And we get ingredients, we get uh, nuts and seeds and shredded coconut and sometimes if we're feeling really crazy we'll get like goji berries or like raisins. <laughs> you can do something simpler. And we put this out at health fairs. We do this as like a three o'clock break and you give everybody a little baggie and people absolutely love this. They love doing this. There's a company you can order from and the reason I'm bringing, has anybody ever ordered from nuts.com? You guys, hand one up. How fun is their packaging? <laughs> there you go, that's your answer. That was a laugh. Um, really hysterical. This is the box, this is like their box that you'll get shipped to your office. It's hysterical. Even if you just order one time, for the experience of it, it's really cool. So nuts.com has all, every ingredient you could possibly want for a trail mix. After leaving the summit last year, we added a question to our interest survey. We asked people, we said, wouldn't it be cool if we, and we let them answer the question. And one of our employees said, had a healthy ice cream treat on a hot summer day. So we thought, hmm, how can we make that align with 
providing nourishing food. So we have a very creative wellness team, and we decided that what we had to do is to buy a Yonana's machine. <laughs> this is the coolest machine ever, and it's only about $40, and it makes frozen yogurt out of frozen fruit. And so we had, we have a lot of millennials in our office, so I'll explain the title in a moment. We had a YOLO make your own Froyo event. <laughs> So this is you only live once, make your own frozen yogurt. <laughs> and people loved this. Guess how many incentives we had to provide? Zero. There was the social incentive of it was a fun experience, so they showed up. That's what happened. And this is a really, really fun thing to do. It's super inexpensive, really fun, brings people together. They love it. We had like a toppings bar. People love customizing things. It was super fun and went over really well. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do, this is going to be kind of rapid fire. I'm going to give you guys three minutes to come up with at your table. What is something you've done or could do to make food an enjoyable or fun experience at your company? And then we're going to share a few. So I'd like you to take three minutes and do that right now. Just chat with your table mates. Well, you guys, I, I love the energy that just like came out of that conversation. We could spend an entire hour just doing that activity, I realize, right? I mean, you really could. So I encourage you to continue this discussion at lunch, right? We're going to be talking, eating food and we can talk more about food. So I would like to hear, I would like to hear from, th from three people. I would like to hear your idea, something that maybe if somebody at your table had some really, really cool idea. Yeah, right there. have vegetables and spiralize them into noodles. And we had a whole bunch of different healthy toppings for that. Very cool. So it was a pastaless pasta bar. I use a spiralizer. It's a really inexpensive tool to make pasta out of like zucchini and squash and super fun. I love that idea. Yeah. Right up front. Sure. Come with your microphone. Um, we just do... Uh, as a way to kind of fight back against the vending machines, which we weren't able to change um, kind of countywide, I work with the county program, we have a couple of departments that have our kind of um, healthy fridge and pantry that we maintain. So it has, um, it's just stocked with all kinds of healthy food and um, people just pay, you know, they pay and then we kind of maintain, I have an intern that maintains it, but it's, it's utilized, it has, um, you know, everything from hard boiled eggs, hummus, veggies, Granola bars, healthy ones. Great. Um, oatmeal, you know, Amy's soups, lots of, lots of really good food. So that's been a, a success story. Great. Thank you. We'll take two. All right, sure, right there. Yeah. Me again. Um, we did last month, and it was a um, March National Nutrition Month, so we did a St. Patrick's Day food tour. And so what we did is we reached out to several restaurants that are in the local area within walking dis distance. So it was about a two-mile walk, an hour and a half event, and it was completely free, and we didn't realize that restaurants are super eager to give out samples to people. So we made sure that, you know, the food was green, so Brussels sprouts, um, smoothie shots, falafel, things like that, still healthy. And we did a walking food tour. Very cool, love that. Is there one more person who's like, oh my gosh, Rachel, if I don't say it, I'm gonna lose it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then by the way, if you guys are, tw or if, again, if you're on Twitter, it would be really cool that, to, to mention one of your ideas. So hashtag Welcoa Summit 2016, if you wanna post an idea you didn't get to say on Twitter, um, that would be great. Sure, we'll take one more. To celebrate diversity at our workforce, uh, for our workforce, we have monthly lunch and language events, and so we celebrate a culture and provide a healthy version of that culture. Wonderful. So, yeah. I love that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So that, those were great ideas. Give yourselves a hand for those awesome ideas. And if you want to chat with me or email me, I'll have my contact information up here afterwards. I'm happy to hear any other ideas that you guys have. So we're just going to um, close our, our, our time as we, again, just literally touch on this last part, which is nourish, about nourishing ourselves. This is about, again, giving our body the life-giving, fueling food that makes us feel our best. So we want to invite people to be curious about what they eat. We want to move away from telling them what to eat. We want to allow them to explore. How does it make them feel? Does it give them energy? Does it make them feel tired? Do they like the taste? Do they not? Does it make them feel good? Does it not make them feel good? For people to start to notice this instead of waiting for us to tell them. 
And as people start connecting with why they're eating, as we start connecting with why we're eating, if we're eating foods because we want to have energy, we're going to feel more energized. We're going to eat a certain type of food. If we want to feel more alive, we're going to eat living food because the life in food gives us life. We're going to eat food that was alive at one point. It was growing in the ground or on a tree or it was running around on a field or it was flying in the air, swimming in the water. It was growing or had a pulse. Living food, and ideally the most colorful food, vibrant, colorful foods build vibrant, colorful, beautiful, vibrant bodies. All of these organizations, I think we can agree that these are pretty reputable organizations when it comes to health. They, along with research done on blue zones, which are the regions around the world where people live the longest and, and have really thriving, thriving cultures and health, they agree on this. We want to eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And you might say, Rachel, I've heard that before. It's so simple. That's the point. We have made food so complicated that we have gotten away from a simple truth like this. And if we can just encourage and give the message to our employees to eat food, real food, the foods I was just mentioning, not too much, because guess what? When we slow down to savor, we eat less because we're more satisfied. And mostly plants because we know we know, again, that people that live the longest, that have the most vibrant health, that's what they're doing. Those are the most nutrient-packed foods. So we want to encourage this. And we do a program at our company called JERF. Teach me how to JERF. <laughs> JERF stands for Just Eat Real Food. And we used to do this on an annual basis, but now we're going to be doing it quarterly because people love it so much. And the way that it works is, again, we're encouraging eating real food. We're not villainizing or demonizing any food. There's no need. We have limited air time. We want people to get excited about this way of eating, not scared of the other way. It's not what we want to do, right? So what this looks like, we do potlucks. We have group potlucks where people come together, and they, on sign-up sheets, they will buddy up with somebody, and then they'll share in the cost of the groceries for the week, and then they will make breakfast together. Some people will make frittatas that they'll share, or smoothies. We bought an office Vitamix, one of the best investments ever. It is fantastic. And people use it every morning to make smoothies. I teach cooking demonstrations. I'm certified in culinary nutrition. And I love to do this because what it does is it equips people with a skill that most people do not have. Most people are afraid to cook. We don't know how to chop stuff. We don't know how to dice things. We don't know how to use the food processor we got for our wedding that's in the basement in a closet somewhere. <laughs> and so by giving people these skills, equipping them with skills, we empower them. And so one of the things, I remember the first cooking demonstration I went to at our company about six years ago was to learn how to make guacamole. And I was a very picky eater. And I did not want to try this because I had convinced myself, for whatever reason, that guacamole was made with mayonnaise. <laughs> uh, yeah, not, not the sharpest, but I... <laughs> If you ever had guacamole, it is not made with mayonnaise. And so as I watched them prepare it, I thought, hmm, I like all of those ingredients. Maybe I'll like guacamole. And I tried it. Oh my gosh, best day ever. Guacamole is one of the best foods on the planet Earth. Anybody else? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Cinco de Mayo is coming up. I mean, man, can you imagine if my whole life I was missing out on guacamole? So we give people opportunities to do this. And again, we're inviting their curiosity and we're saying, it's a safe space, just try it. If you don't like it, that's fine, just try it. You're going to have some free resources that will be available to you on the Walcoa portal. This is courtesy of Sean Foy, so thank you, Sean, for making these available. And it's a restaurant guide. This is something, if you wanted to do like a JERF program at your company, you could supply this to your employees. And then there's also a list of, a packet of recipes that has 30 different recipes in it that are all real food recipes. And I'll also be including some links to recipes on my blog that are some of the ones that I typically make in these classes. And so that'll be on the portal once the conference is over. As we close, and I go into this final giveaway and takeaway for you guys, I hope it's been clear today that this is true, that the way we do food is the way we do life. This is not just about food. Food and life are about connection, enjoyment, celebration, togetherness, nourishment. And when we start to realize that, we start to eat differently. Vic was mentioning something about kindness in the talk that he was giving, and so I thought, gosh, how perfect that 
one of the companies that I feel like does this best, makes this connection between food and life, is the company Kind, Kind Snacks. I learned a bit about how this company started. It was started by a man named Daniel Lebetsky, and his father was a concentration camp survivor. And when he was a young boy in the concentration camps, a German soldier kicked him a potato. So this is his peace offering, right? Here's some food. They weren't supposed to do this. So he kicked him a potato, and at that time, Daniel was a young boy. He, I mean, Daniel's father was a young boy, and he realized in that moment that in the darkest of times, people could be kind. And that's where the name of the company came from. And he's written a book called Do the Kind Thing. So they've done something kind for us today. When you return from lunch, you will all have a new, one of the newest kind bars. It is a dark chocolate almond mint, yes. <laughs> You'll have one of those at your table. They're not even available in some areas yet. It's like their version of a thin mint and it is amazing. So you're gonna get that, and then you're also gonna get something really cool called a Spread Kind Awesome card. You're gonna get one of these, and what this allows you to do is if someone does something kind for you, you're gonna carry this in your pocket, and when someone does something kind, you're gonna whip out your Spread Kind Awesome card, you're gonna give it to them. And then they're gonna enter, they're gonna go online, enter a code on the back, and then Kind is gonna send them a couple Kind bars. So this, again, it's about connection, right? Food can be connecting, food can be so positive. And they extend their motto to say this, do the kind thing for your body, for your taste buds, and for your world. This is about connecting, doing the kind thing for our world, and connecting with why we eat and where our food comes from and the impact it has beyond our plate. It's about doing the kind thing for our taste buds and slowing down enough to savor and taste our food so that we can actually enjoy and experience it. And it's about doing the kind thing for our body and nourishing ourselves with the most energizing, healing, life-giving foods so that we can feel our best. So let's come together. Let's come together as an industry and reframe this. Let's take a refreshing approach about what to eat in a way that is energizing, inspiring, and makes people feel alive. Let's eat on purpose. Thank you.